decent slide. I asked you to watch it on your own. This was an exercise. Any questions about that? Yeah, so for the stochastic gradient descent with momentum, as well as the atom optimizer, how do you usually initialize your velocity and momentum? Is it zero? Yes. So initially, this is zero. And then uh, same thing here. For this momentum, mt, that's zero. That's how you initialize them. OK, thanks. And then one more on the ADA delta optimizer. So I, I get that, that g is, the, is the, the gradient. And because you're taking a mini batch, it's stochastic or, or random in a sense. So you're taking an expected value. Um, is, is that expected value sort of just like a standard arithmetic mean? Are you sort of just estimating that? How is that calculated? So that's a good question, actually. So what I want you to think about, this is just a notation. So this is just the variable. Give it a name. Give it, uh, I don't know, maybe let's give it gamma as the name or give it some name. So this is a variable that you're updating from one iteration to the next iteration. It's very similar to what you had for vt minus one here or mt minus one there. So you can just give this guy a name. There is no operation being done. It's just a variable that's updated. So you are not doing any expected value here. It's a notation. I see, thank you. Maybe it would have been better if I gave this a name and the other one a name, but this should be good enough. So it's just a notation. This is a variable that's getting updated from one iteration to the next iteration. And um, to better understand the notation right above that, GT, um, the gradient element-wise product is a sum. So can we just understand that as a, a norm, the, the norm of the gradient in, in some? Uh, so the norm of a vector is a scalar, am I right? Right, it's the square um, of itself on each element, add it together and then take the root. Yes, but what you are gonna get out of this is still gonna end up being a vector. So I think the confusion is what is this summation over? This summation is over the previous time steps. So it's from time t, time t minus one up until the first time. Now, what you're doing is summing a bunch of vectors element-wise. So when you sum a bunch of elements, vectors element-wise, you're going to end up with a vector in the end, OK? To get the norm, you are doing a summation of your gradients squares, but you are doing your summation over the elements of the gradients, over the elements of your vectors. This summation is element-wise summation over the past. I see. So it's a, it's a squared vector, basically. Exactly. So you take your vectors, square them element-wise. The first element, you square it. The second element, you square it. And the result of that operation is going to end up being a vector of the same size. Thank now you have, I don't know, T of those vectors that you're summing together. And that's going to give you GT. And every operation that you see here is element-wise. So this is a vector which could be positive or negative, by the way. Some elements of this could be positive or negative. Elements of GT are always going to be positive. It could be zero. That's why you add epsilon to avoid the chances of dividing by zero. The square root is element-wise per each element of your vector. This division is going to end up being element-wise because of this circle dot. So everything is element-wise. Any other questions? And in this slide, theta corresponds to B of the previous slide. So these are the parameters of your model. So somebody somehow magically gave us the correct alphas, the hyperparameters. Now we are just using them. We are solving this argmin problem. We are looking at the loss and we minimize that. In the uh, NADM or NADM uh, method, we have like theta, which corresponds to beta, but what does beta one correspond to? So this is a coefficient and it's gonna be 0 0.99. So it's just a scalar and beta two, you also need to have a beta two, it's here. That one is 0 0.999. So initially uh, you, are, you have a bias 
towards whatever initial values you had for your M and V. But as you go from one step of the training to the step of the optimization, these M's are gonna get updated. Does that answer your question? So from one slide to the next slide, the notation might change because these are from different papers and I want to stick to the notation of the paper because later on you might want to read the paper for details. But uh, it should be okay. It shouldn't confuse you. So beta is 0 0.99. The other one is 0 0.999. And the question is, how do you set them? It's my question for you. How do you set it? How did you come up with that? And by the way, this eta is 10 to the power negative three. How do we come up with those numbers? Exactly. So it's going to happen on your validation. So these are part of your alpha. Okay. Is everything clear? Any other questions? So when you're validating, there can be almost more parameters to check for than when you're, than when you're training. So when, when, when you're in effect of like when you're training and validating these networks is, is most of the computational time soaked up in the validation portion? Yes. Training is slow. It's going to take for that tabular data. It's going to be really fast because you have very few data. So for that, you're going to be in, in a matter of seconds, train your parameters. But when you go to bigger data sets like ImageNet or data for text, it could take a week or two to train your model on multiple GPUs in parallel because of the size of data and the size of your model. So each round of this training is going to take uh, around one week. And then you start, you need to, thinking about alpha as well, you need to do training multiple times for each choice of alpha. And that's going to be time consuming. And that's why validation, you usually uh, try to end up with a small number of choices. For instance, maybe 10 to the power negative three, negative four, and negative five. For your learning rate, you test them. You don't test all the available options. And for beta, it's the same thing. You test a couple of options. But when you go to AutoML, and let's say you are working in Google, you're going to have a lot of time and resources at your fingertips. So you're going to do this properly. And that's going to become auto ML. So this validation, you can somehow use your intuition of what should be the best alphas. And at the same time, uh, try to limit your choices. But you're right. This could become very slow if you want to do it properly. OK. Thank Does you. that answer your question? Yeah, that was great. OK, perfect. Any other questions? And the other thing that I want to emphasize is this mini batch training. You can look at the entire batch of your data. For instance, here in the previous slide, you could take a look at all 150 examples, or you can look at five examples at a time. And that's why you get the name stochastic gradient descent, because this is a stochastic approximation of your true loss. Why is this useful? Yes, for 150, maybe you are able to process the entire data at once. You do that summation that you have here over your entire data. But as you go to 1 million data points, then computing this summation becomes really slow because you need to take an image, push it through your model, which is a giant model, get the corresponding probability only for one example. Now you need to do it for 1 million examples. The summation is going to end up being super slow. But the good thing is that all you need is an approximation to your gradient to do the training. Your gradients don't have to be perfect. Is that point clear as well? I need to hear a couple of yeses before I move on. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, this is the last chance to ask a question because I'm gonna go to the next topic.